I'm Ann Bikey. I'm a licensed counselor and I do pet loss and bereavement counseling with those who anticipate or who have lost an animal companion. Just give you a little bit of background about myself. As I said, I am a licensed counselor. You have to be licensed in this state to hang out a shingle. And my own experience with pet loss uh, was like numerous people, my first loss was hit me in the face like a ton of bricks. I never knew that I could feel the way that I did because I had never experienced it before. Subsequently, I had numerous pets then that I lost over the years, but as I watched my 16-year-old golden retriever age and I knew that she was at end of life, I discovered that I was, I was just not prepared for it. And I wondered how I was going to get through it. I knew that I had lots of friends who could help me get through it, but I realized as a counselor at that time that other people were experiencing the same things. If, there, if I was experiencing this, other people were experiencing it too. And who did they have to go to to help support them through the loss? Hence, my business was born, and it has been an incredible opportunity to work with people, to walk alongside mm -hmm. them through their grief, uh, to help them understand that they will get through it, that we walk through that mourning process, and there is a reconciliation, and we know that our life will go on. And I thank Jeff for mentioning me numerous times in his column, and then also for French to allow me to have a group here once a month. And I do individual counseling with folks in their own home. Thanks for being here. Thank you to Gail for the festival. Thank you. Jeff. Well, I'm Dr. Jeff Nichol. I'm a veterinarian. And I've been at it a long time, <laughs> since 1974. Um, and. Uh, doing a lot of emergency work and a lot of internal medicine, oncology, those kinds of things. Um, these pets don't always uh, survive as long as we'd like them to, and even when they do, it's very hard for people. Um, and it's the practicing veterinarian with pets who's usually on the front line of these things because we're the ones who have the bad news. Um, and it, you would think that it's always a very different situation if a pet gets hit by a car and comes in uh, terminal. It's a sudden shock. Um, but, you know, chronic disease that, you know, we make progress with it and ultimately we have to uh, throw in the towel. And it's hard for people. And, you know, I've often been surprised with how people respond. People, I think, are going to completely fall apart, seem to manage it with stoicism and others uh, really struggle. They really can't predict. But, you know, with the changes in our society, uh, we are getting more fragmented. People don't live with other people as much as they once did. A lot of people live alone. And the relationship that they have with pets, um, this doesn't go for everybody by any means, but there are people where that relationship is much more significant than any human they know. Um, that you, and this might sound a little trite, but you can share things with a pet that you've never told another person. <laughs> you know, they never betray a trust. Uh, they never walk out on you. Uh, and they forgive. And, uh, and so those relationships are, are not the same uh, as they are with other people. And the loss uh, might be tough. And so very often when I've faced that kind of thing and I follow up with people, I, I refer to Dan and say, look, there's somebody who's a specialist in this stuff and who uh, understands. Because many times people's friends don't. You know, it's just an animal. Well, I, you know, my wife is not just a person, not to me, and my pets aren't just animals either. Um, but not everybody's like that. Um, and so the veterinarians have to try to figure out which people might need help, because some of them need a lot of help. And anyway, that's what I had to offer at this point. Okay. Good morning, I'm Julie, I'm Julie Keller. Uh, I manage Best Friends Pet Cremation Services. I also manage Sunset Memorial Park. So. Um, Primarily, we do help families that have decided cremation is the option that they would like for their pet. Um, but we also get to come alongside people that say, hey, I'm not sure that's for me. So 
Sunset has a separate part of the park in our non-perpetual care. We have a pet cemetery called Best Friends Forever. So sometimes we're helping families say goodbye to their loved one um, out here in our pet cemetery. Um, and the nice thing about that is that if the human decides that they wanted to choose cremation for themselves, they can actually be buried with their pet in that part of the park, um, which, which you're not typically allowed to do out here from that standpoint. So um, I think I'm still learning so much more about pets than I thought that, you know, again, to echo some of the things Jeff said, oh, it's just a pet. No, there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more as we make these arrangements. There's a whole lot more complexity and things that are coming in. Of People share, people are, I appreciate the vulnerability that people share and say, this was my child, or I could never have children, so this is my child, or, or if there's still a connection to a loved one, if this was my mom's pet, and my mom died a few months ago, and now yeah. I, you know, the pet has passed away. <coughs> so there's a whole lot more complexity and things that we are, are still learning in, um, on that standpoint. That just, um, and often for children, that's our first first experience because, you know, pets don't live as long as humans. Sometimes we have a lot of kiddos that are coming in because they're saying goodbye to their goldfish or their bird or their cat or their dog or their bunny. Um, and so there's a lot of, I feel like, there's a lot of chance to educate and come alongside and say, like, you know, let's, let's work on this. Let me, let me help you from that standpoint. That's actually a good point about children and death. Yeah. That, um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because as older people, maybe we're, you know, we're experiencing more of the human deaths and the complications that come with that, but the love of an animal is so simple and honest uh, that it can be uh, different for a child, for a, an adult. Um, I don't know, Anne, maybe that's something you could sure. start off on. Sure, well, as adults, we have a lot of life experience and we've often had many, many pets in our life. And as we get older and we experience loss ourselves, it gets to be a little tougher. For children, it's, sometimes it's, it's not as tough, and sometimes it is. And sometimes children react a little differently, maybe than we think they might. And Jeff, you may want to weigh in on this in terms of, of the euthanasia piece, whether whether we allow children a certain age to actually be in to witness end of life with a pet. Uh, that gets to be a little bit more complicated and I always ask folks to talk with with their vet about that. Um, you have the experience well, of that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's one huge difference between end of life for humans mm -hmm. versus other species mm -hmm. and you know, on one level, yeah, it's fortunate that, you know, the, we don't use the term pet owner the way we once did. Um, people often, uh, I, I use the term pet parent again because so many people, uh, that's their family. And um, you, they sometimes have to make that call. And, uh, and again, the practicing veterinarian is the first one to talk with them about that. I, you know, I'm reminded of a story um, a number of years ago, I, I owned a, a general veterinary practice, the Adobe Animal Medical Center on 4th Street, and I had a number of veterinarians in my employ, and one was a young doctor who had been in practice maybe a year and a half, and, uh, you know, we were all busy, and she had this case that was, this pet, this dog was elderly, like 16 years old or something, it was in often, and the family was very bonded to the dog, and uh, it had a handful of terminal diseases, multi-systemic organ failure. The whole system was starting to come down like a house of cards. And she kept um, uh, researching and consulting and finding ways of keeping this dog propped up. And, so, and you know, that's, let's face it, we're all getting propped up, you know? Um, but uh, in reality, th th there comes a time when, you know, where's the line? And it might be in a different place for different people. But I would kind of, when I had a minute, stand back and watch her visiting with these people and, and treating this dog. And then this young doctor went out of town for close to a week and the dog came in. I saw it and um, I talked to the people and I went through the record in great detail the way I never had because I'd never really been involved in the case and the lab work and the x-rays and all that stuff. And, uh, and I just looked him straight in the eye and I said, you know, it's time. We need to put this dog down, and here's why. This is the, the quality of life that we have now. 
you folks have been so committed, and you've 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 loved this dog, and now it's time to give the ultimate gift. And uh, and they, like so many people, had this clear sense of relief. Yeah, we now have permission. We've got to do this. And so we euthanized the pet, and then my associate came back a few days later. She was livid. And uh, there was some retribution on her part. And the problem with sometimes medical practitioners is that they get too, uh, they buy into other people's feelings too much. Empathy is a very important thing. But your feelings are not mine. They're yours. And um, you learn those things through maturity. But you, um, in, in the business of dealing with the loss of someone else, you have to be there for them, but you can't take it over because that's selfish. That's self-indulgent. And um, you're not providing a service if you do that. Maybe to yourself. But that's not what you're getting paid for. You know, it's a job. And it's part of the job, and we have to do it right. So there's a lot that I've had to go for the years. And I don't know if you use a quality of life scale at all. There, there are several quality of life scales that you can go online and get. And um, a vet oncologist, and now I, now I can't remember his name, he was at PCA, uh, he told me this year right. ago. Yes, Rick, right. yeah, Rick. Yeah. Okay, so he had mentioned to me that that he's got the rule of three. And that's three things that your pet loves to do. Your animal companion loves to go out for walks. They love their treats. They love to cuddle. They love to romp through the house, whatever it is. When they can't do two of those, yeah. it's time to think about yeah. euthanasia. Yeah, and, and the quality of life scales are pretty, um, pretty detailed. So if you are in that situation or you know of anyone who is, Going online and looking at those is is a good thing. And, it, and if you have animal companions now and you're soon faced with it, or even if you're not faced with it, I always am, am all about thinking about these things in advance so we don't get so emotional we can't make the decisions that are best, is take a look at that and just do a gut check and see where you're at with that. And be realistic about, am I going to take all of these measures to keep my animal companion alive when I know that they are suffering? They're not telling me that they're suffering. But they are. Their quality of life is, is poor. And you, you, as Jeff said, you want to give them the ultimate gift of a humane end of life. Well, yeah. And it, but you, you're absolutely right, and I and I think those online tools are good, you know, to give people an opportunity to gather information. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure in Julie's work too, and all three of us, you have to sometimes be that voice of objectivity mm -hmm. for yeah. people mm -hmm. that yeah. they cannot possibly be expected to do that. Um, and when it's been my own pets, I certainly cannot. If one of my pets gets sick, it's really pretty minor. I'll treat it. Otherwise, I take it into the hospital and ask one of my colleagues, would you deal with this for me? I mean, and we all, we do that for each other. You, you know, physicians said no business treating their family either. <laughs> um, so the objectivity, we need to provide that service. And so often I see in veterinary clinics now, the staff, the pet gets euthanized, and the staff all walks around, and they're just, they're all bereaved themselves, and they can't do any work, and it's like, Wait a minute, you know what? You just provided a really valuable service. These people need this, and, um, and feel good about that. Because nobody lasts forever. Nobody gets out of this thing alive. You know, we talk about loss of life. Of course. You know? Of course there's loss of life. You know? But we instead we can provide that service. And uh, we're not cheerful about it. But I walk away from those going, we did the right thing. And I applaud you today of even what you're doing today with, with whatever, yeah. whether, whether it's pets or whether it's your own uh, situation or someone else you're caring for. Educate yourself, and if you're not in the situation where you are having to make an end-of-life decision, do it now and, and educate yourself and ask these sure. questions and pre-plan, I mean, from, with whatever that is, so that even if you're not funding it, 
tell your family, I don't want to be cremated, or I do want this, or this is what I want for my pet, or so that when the time comes, you can just focus on your family and what you're dealing with, and you're not dealing with all of those administrative things or you feel like you're having to make a decision quickly that you know you're feeling pressure or whatever. So at any point with, with whatever, ask these questions, attend seminars, go online, take tours of places so that you know exactly what do I want and write it down and tell someone so that because I, as we see sometimes a little more on the human side of if you didn't tell your family, your loved ones are back and forth with, do you, do you think mom wanted this or do you, I don't know, I'm not sure. And so they're in agony of they're not, they want to they honor you the best that they can, but if you haven't told them what you want, that does give them some extra angst and, stre and stress. So I would say tell your family what you, what you want or what you don't want. And I love what Jeff said about that having someone else who is objective about the situation. And that is your vet. So one of the things that I'm talking about with folks also is what's your relationship with your vet? Is this, is your vet, has your vet been caring for your animal companion for the last 14 years? And be honest with them and saying, please tell me what your thought is at this point and what a, what a decision that you had to make when, when your colleague was out of town and you had to tell this family, but the relief of somebody who is uh, a, a doctor, who is a veterinarian, who is skilled in this, saying, it is time. I, I see that over and over again. I, you know, what a, a gut-wrenching decision to have to make and a gut-wrenching decision uh, to, to be there if that's what you choose to do, but at the same time, it is the kindest, most humane thing that we can do. Yeah. Well, you know, here's a question for you, Julie. Do you ever get these, um, I'm sure you must, with people who uh, they want to make a decision about what happens to the pet when they pass on? Maybe they're terminally ill or they're quite elderly and they've got a very closely bonded pet who is not elderly. And um, very often I found these people I usually live alone and um, they don't know anybody who they would want to have their pet when they die. What happens when I die to my pet? We do get asked that occasionally, um, and so we try to help them find yeah. it. Where, where I can, if it's something where they have purchased property where I can put notes in you know, as much as I can, but yes, we encourage families to say, okay, if you, you, know, if you think that shadow might outlive you, find somebody or, you know, or from that standpoint of what can we put in place so that we can take care of them and make sure that they're taken care of. I think the business of being buried or cremated or having the ashes together with, um, with a pet, I think it's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like I said. It's a tremendous need. thing because you yep. have both sides. Yeah. Yep, yep, for sure. Yeah. And, that was, and that was the need with, again, with Friend to Mortuary to say, here's another way we can help because so in 2010, that's when we opened Best Friends Forever because it was like, okay, there's a need and people want to be with their loved one because sometimes that, you know, their fur babies are their loved ones, so how can I, yeah. how can we make that happen? I'd like to have a voice uh, from our audience member here. Uh, this is Jim Plitz. He's with Morris Hall, and um, he actually uh, writes about pet trusts or helps with oh, pet trusts. So the conversation is the key thing, right? And you could do anything from just talking about with your neighbor or your daughter or your son, you're going to take care of Fluffy or Fido or your pet. But it could be more robust. You could create a trust uh, for your pet because like, so for my pets, well, I'm, I have three, three dogs right now and uh, I'm leaving them to my brother, uh, but he's a school teacher. And so he doesn't have the financial resources to add three more mouths to his family. Uh, so I'm giving him money to. So in my estate plan, I've identified whatever pets I have living so I don't identify well, my pets are named Will and Trust and Sissy. Uh, I don't say they're getting those pets, they're going to get whatever pets I have at the time. But I've identified a dollar amount to go to him, as well as the pets. If I don't have pets, I've now said, okay, since I was going to give him that money, I'm going to give it to charity, and I choose Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. But uh, starting the conversation is, is yeah. a critical part so that the people around you, and it's not just death, too. I mean, that's what we're all talking about, but what if you're in the hospital for three weeks? Who's feeding your pet? Mm -hmm. 
during that time. So it's just start the conversation. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Really yes. smart. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed in pet cemeteries is the emotion that goes on those headstones that you don't usually see in people cemeteries. Um, anybody want to weigh in on, on the, the quality of the emotional connection we have with our pets? <laughs> that was huge. And I, yeah. I suspect yeah. that everyone here has has a pet, an animal companion has had one, and we know, as Jeff said, they they don't talk back, they don't go to the prom, they don't have to go to college, they don't right. want a fancy car. Yeah, so, I, I have been reading yeah. your column every week religiously, yeah. <laughs> so, so the connection that we have with them is so huge. And what what you're saying, Gail, about what we we put and what our last words are uh, to our animal companion is just a, a snippet of how big they are in our life. And we know what our connections are with people, and they're real, and they're genuine, and they're deep, and they're loving. And in, in most cases, uh, and, and if they're not, maybe those are people who are not in our life, or we wish that they maybe weren't. But uh, uh, <clears throat> we can check friends off the list and say they're yeah. no longer our friends, right? But with our with our animal companions, they're they're um, it's it's just that genuineness. So why wouldn't we give those last words that are are on um, uh, on the the stone to them and? Tell me, what is that called? Is it the tombstone? Is that what it's still called? The, the headstone, head stone, the, the head marker. Stone, the marker. Okay. So that that really just uh, captures the the love that we have. And uh, let me ask the audience: How many of you have animal companions? Okay. So almost almost all of you do, and some of you have had. Yes. Okay. So you know what uh, that deep relationship is like and it doesn't it's not surprising to me that that's what's on that we see these things on the marker mm -hmm. and i think because most of the time you you have a pet because you want that relationship i think again sometimes on the human side of sometimes you're caring for a loved one that you didn't have a relationship with it just was like well i'm the nephew and there isn't any, you know and so you didn't know great aunt maude and so there is a little bit of like, I want to, you know, do what I'm, I'm taking care of it better, but you have that pet because you wanted to have that relationship and you have that relationship. So sometimes it's more, on the human side, sometimes it's more of a, a duty or a, it's the right thing to do versus with the pet. It's, you know, there is a whole lot more emotion because you have that special relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting business. I'm curious to know if for people who... Uh, want to put their pets down, if the um, veterinary offices have a place that's, you know, conducive <laughs> spiritually or whatever, but the comfort of the animal, the family, the environment that it has. Right, yeah, th that's a, been a shift over the last uh, five, ten years that veterinary clinics have set aside one room for that kind of thing, and it usually has uh, comfortable furniture in it and a, a table lamp instead of, you know, fluorescent lighting and a stainless steel table uh, for exams. Yeah, that shift is, is being made. And, you know, I, when I graduated veterinary school in the, in the mid-70s, they, they typically, when a, somebody wanted their pet euthanized, just, nobody ever even thought about doing it differently. It's just, you know how things are. You know, why do you always cut the end off the roast, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you would just take the pet and people would have a tearful goodbye and you'd take the pet and euthanize it in the treatment area. Well, that's a very different thing now. We always ask people if they want to be with the pet, and almost always they do. And so to the thing about the children, um, I have, uh, you know, I, I try not to cross boundaries, but when there's a family, I'll say to the kids, I don't ask their parents. I say, would you like to be there too? And the parents usually will um, 
respect the children's decision in almost all cases. But if they say, no, this child is not ready for that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, I'm certainly not going to argue by any stretch. But um, I think that the children need to have a voice in that. They need to have closure. And, and euthanasia now is a, is a lot more peaceful than it once was. There's a, there's a procedure for it now, other than just giving an intravenous injection. Um, the pet is sedated first, and then uh, an IV catheter is put in the, in the vein. And then we have the family come in, and they can spend all the time they want to, um, before the pet is sedated, but then again after. And then when everybody's ready, we'll give the injection to the catheter. The pet's already pretty much anesthetized. It's just a matter of you know, the activity of the heart and the brain stopping. So by working through this thing in, in stages, people can sort of adjust to each stage and, and we can like work with them. Well, things are different than they used to be and, and you know to your question, yes, there are most veterinary, I don't know about most, but many and maybe most veterinary clinics have a special See, place. Mine, I, there was no option. You know, it was just this is the way it's done yeah. and it didn't occur to me. Yeah. Well, now, <laughs> things are, the other options. Yeah, I mean, in the standard of care in many respects and not just the the emotions and the feelings, but you know, the, the medical and scientific aspect, all of those standards of care have continued to improve and change. Well, and home yeah, euthanasia is cycling. now being offered. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're actually, like, I'm seeing a cycle back to something that to me resonates with something that was, you know, 50 or 100 years ago of in-home euthanasia. Oh, that sure. is very much, yeah. that is, that is very oh, much yeah. common, and so that yeah. even more of, yeah. now everyone's a little more comfortable because it's my house where you oh, don't yeah. have to stress about loading the pet into the car sure. or bringing my kids and so yeah. um I, and i think that's that's been very positive yeah that's mm -hmm. right yeah we've done a lot of that yes um i'm a hospice volunteer who goes into people's homes mm -hmm. uh, there are varying financial backgrounds if somebody doesn't have a vet and they don't have the financial resources to avail themselves of a pet cemetery or a vet or a counselor are there any resources? I mean, their family is going to say, what do we do with Fido? Well, Animal Humane provides low cost and I think sometimes no cost uh, services Humane. for, mm -hmm. you know, low income people. Sure. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't say that they have a, a licensed counselor who volunteers for that stuff. But well, I do a group there. Okay. I do a group there right. mm -hmm. also. Yeah. And I always give people an option of uh, a sliding scale. So, and if someone wanted to come to a group and they were absolutely not able to uh, pay the cost of that, I, I would work with them also. <coughs> but I, I believe that, um, like Jeff said, they, they do euthanasia. Oh, sure. Yes, yeah. they do euthanasia there. And I don't know of any other group that does besides <coughs> animal Well, the Animal Welfare Department. Well, also yes. animal control. Yeah. And they are a lot more in touch oh, with yes. the, uh, the feelings and, and the, you know, the, the realities than the dog pounds of generations mm -hmm. past. Um, and, uh, and they do that for no charge. Um, but I don't have any direct knowledge of exactly how it's done yeah. there. Um, you know, our capitalistic society is, you know, you, if you can't afford what you want, then you're not going to get what you want necessarily. But there's a lot of there's a lot of compassion when it comes to pets. Um, it might be easier to find than, than it is with people, and um, it is. Uh, and so you, uh, <laughs> you know, most veterinarians got a soft spot, and you people come and say, "Geez, I've got a problem. What do I do?" And I'll I'll figure it out. We'll help you out with it. I mean, we do it all the time. And I'm also yeah. happy to provide resources. I have a. Um, uh, rack card here that you can take with my number information and please if you get to that situation if you're in that situation I can certainly provide resources and I get a lot of calls also I, I guess I just pop up when somebody's doing a, a some research online about in-home euthanasia I get a lot of calls about in-home euthanasia so people must think that I'm a vet or I, I still haven't quite figured out why I pop up where I do. Uh, so I've got that problem, but for a different reason. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> we'll talk about that oh, later. Right. Sounds well, like a counseling, counseling session. session. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do have a list of, of, of 
vets who provide in-home euthanasia, and, and yeah. I would agree. One um, thing I want to ask you is, where do you think the shift was? That, yes, this was the way it always was. We took our, our pet into the vet, had it had uh, our pet euthanized and it was a you know not a really a comforting experience or uh, in any way shape or form where was the change that our society started to say we need to be compassionate about the people who are losing their animal companions also i think we can thank capitalism ah yes you know yes. I, um, societal shifts yeah. are created um, some needs that uh, you know, the consumer always wins, and if there's enough people who are willing to say, look, I, I want this, then there, people are going to start saying, well, then I'll provide that service. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I, when I was in veterinary school, 50% uh, of our education was on livestock. And the, the curriculum was what it was. You go to veterinary school, and this is exactly what you take. And now, um, they, uh, if you don't want to learn much about livestock because you're not going to practice a large animal medicine, then you can take other, other electives. Um, and, you know, that's another one of those things. Demand has changed because society has changed. Uh, when it, back in the 70s and 80s, very often I would make a diagnosis and I would say, this is, this is the best thing that we can do for this pet. Here's the estimate. And so often people would put their head on my shoulder, you know, because they were like 40 years my senior. <laughs> and, uh, I was raised on a farm. And of course, I could tell them exactly what they were about to say, you know, because like, we didn't do those things, and it was just a dog, and blah, blah, blah. But you don't hear that anymore, you know? Because it's more of a pets as children kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, there are demand changes, and so there's, yeah, we're going to fill the demand. We're going to, and, uh, you know, I look back all those years ago, and I think, Geez, what were we thinking, or why weren't we thinking? Well, I, I mean, just the way things were done, they cut the end off the roast. And, you know what I mean? And, and in 40 years, people are going to look back at, at this and go, these people were in the dark ages. Well, okay, I'll be dead. I'll, I'll get offended. Julie, just a quick question. Um, we were talking about children <laughs> earlier. What's been your experience when people are coming into best friends with their children? Uh, I, yeah, I think the kids are, I mean, it's often, you know, it's often their pet, so they're very much actively involved. Um, yeah. And I think we see um, a lot of memorialization. I think so whether that's, hey, I want some, you know, part of the pet's cremated remains in a necklace, or I, you know, hey, we offer, Best Friends offers to do an impression of a paw in terracotta clay, so sometimes it's a, a keepsake of, okay, could you do three of those because I have three children and so how, you know, how do I, so each person you know, wants to, to be, to have a part of that dog because it was a member of our family. So I think yeah. they're very, yeah. um, very actively involved in that yeah. stuff. Like, so. yeah. And there again, so I, I, even there's pressure on, I want to get this right because this is the, this, you know, from this kiddo's first experience, I want to make sure that, that they know um, it's okay, it's a safe place, um, I want to help you. And as much as they want to participate from a safety standpoint, we'll let them. And, you know, it was very clear just listening to you talk, uh, Julie, that you're real good at listening. That's right. <laughs> it matters, though, doesn't it? Because everybody's, these individual needs are, they're totally variable. Yes. And so what's best for these folks, what's best for this family, this other person, yes. elderly, whatever the issue is, yes. um, you're going to have to custom fit it. And, and, and being respectful because some people, yeah, right. they don't want to walk through my door. This is a scary place. So yeah. sometimes it is of just, yeah. here, could you just take care of this? Absolutely. Thank you yeah. for your trust. We'll, you know, we'll yeah, that's right. And so it is. Yeah. I'm just trying to. And you have to, you have to listen. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's part of the empathy. Yeah. Okay. And you do offer a place where someone could bring the animal in and spend time with yes. it before. Yes, so in our arrangement rooms, yes. If you mm -hmm. can, I would say the only exception is sometimes we've had a few Great Danes and, and my arrangement room cannot accommodate that. Um, <laughs> But most of the time, yes, if you, if most, a lot of families will be bringing their loved one in, and that is expected, and their loved one is going to be right here, where they can hold their loved one, or all those going to be doing those types of things. Um, and we even offer, again, I think sometimes it's that heart, it's just one more chance of, I want to honor my loved one and, and walk them home even more, so somewhat like the euthanasia of, we offer what's called a witnessing cremation. So, um, for some of those families that are having a hard time saying goodbye, they can actually come in the back part of, 
um, are more of the industrial area and will help place the pet and they can actually mm -hmm. say goodbye a few minutes longer and participate mm -hmm. as much as we'll, from a safety standpoint if they choose to they can actually place the pet um, help us place the pet in the cremation chamber um, and for some families that's exactly what they need yeah. for closure Good or enough. for some families to say I, you know, I want to trust you. I'm trusting you with this loved one, and I really want to know that this is really my loved one that's going yeah. on there. So, yeah. um, we will do that. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Nice, nice job. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Any other last thoughts uh, from the audience or closing thoughts from our panel members? I think for me, the most difficult thing was to know or to identify when my pet was in pain. You yeah. know, they, they don't tell you that. Well, uh, they do, but you have to know what to look for. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, again, the, the emotional commitment that we have to our pets, it's very hard to be objective. Um, and, uh, again, that's where your veterinarian's really in a position to do something valuable. Um, and, and Taking a history, very often I have people shoot video at home because the way the pet behaves in the exam room is often very different than what they're doing at home. I can watch their gait and I can look at their body signaling uh, in their own environment where you're going to see more. And so if, uh, if people want to get real answers, they should bring in videos. Everybody carries a video camera nowadays, uh, so that's easy to do. But yeah, we can figure that out, <coughs> excuse me, based on exam. Um, and. Uh, and asking questions and listening, um, but being observant um, and doing follow-up, and we can start putting that together. Yeah, but there are there are communications <coughs> that shows, and you just have to know what to look for. And so your job is to educate the patient. Well, we we you certainly want to educate the pet parent, but mm -hmm. again, there's only so much that that they should be responsible for understanding about that stuff because. They're the pet parent, and I'm the objective person on the other side of the exam table, and it's my job to say, this is what's going on, these are the things that we can do going forward, or these are the limited expectations that you should have, or we're close to the end, um, and let's stay in touch. And at the same time, one of the things that I recommend is keeping a log. If you are at the idea. end of uh, the end of life uh, with mm -hmm. your animal companion, keep a log of everything that's happening. Right. That will be valuable mm -hmm. to the vet yeah. if you can take that in with a video. And thank you yeah. for suggesting that. I never thought of that. Oh sure. What what a, a great point. Uh, but. That will also tell you what's happening. This is now the third day that your cat hasn't eaten uh, and they're showing signs of this, that, or something else. Yeah. Um, all good things to know. We can't remember all of those details. It They're also important. helps to alleviate any sense of guilt. When that's it's that's exactly it. right. Well, because people, you're right, because people are actively um, managing and they're doing something. And, uh, and then when, when the time comes, we can really be very clear and say, you know, we all did everything we could. And you did a wonderful job all those years. Yeah, and you've right. helped us right. to understand where we stood every step of the way. And now we can make the right decision. So good job to you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You want to give people something to do or something particularly useful, keep a log. Totally correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Hey Julie, can you two just spend just a second talking about what might happen beyond the death and the cremation? Because back to the question about cost and what to do, and so if I don't have a place, there are people that are also struggling with, okay, do I take my pet cremator remains home? You know, what do I do with them? And there's a solution here at no cost, too. Oh. Yeah, so I would say um, if you felt the cremation was right for your family um, and you're, you reach a point where you think, um, or you are getting older and you think, well, well, my nieces and nephews, you know, do something. So, um, this is our third year. Three. Uh, for the last three years we've offered, it's the last Saturday in August, um, and kind of a play on the name Saturday, we call it Scatter Day. So, we do out here in Best Friends Forever, we have a pet ossuary, and ossuary is just a fancy word for an underground scattering garden. Um, but that is an option and there's no cost, so as long as you know, you're coming in and filling out the information so we know who's in our care, 
Um, and then <coughs> we can scatter and put those cremated remains in our pet ossuary, and they're commingled with other pets, but that way you know that that's where they're going to be, because um, that's part of who we are. We're not in the disposal business. We're in honoring and remembering. So, yeah. so we'll, that is an we'll option. We'll put the pet's name on a, mm -hmm. on a brick on a paper, paper. Mm -hmm. uh, inscribed with the stone, and there's just no cost for that. Mm -hmm. So this is a better place for them to be than eventually in landfill when you're gone and you know your kids or grandkids or whoever, they don't remember that dog. That was your dog. That yeah, was your loved right. one from 20 yeah. or 30 years ago. So I encourage people at some point to find that, that permanent place in them, and you would know where they're at. They're always going to be careful. Yeah. And that came out of some of your earlier questions of yeah. a solution of how did we shift to that? Because, yeah. you know, actually it was our marketing some outside of the industry said, here's a solution. One in five families has cremated remains at home. Be their solution. They have a problem. Help them with this problem yeah. and take cost off the table because that's, you know, and so yeah. it has been, it's yeah. been very... We do the same thing for humans, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it actually started with humans and then people started bringing in petters and we realized, <laughs> better do it for pets too. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. A wonderful panel. Thank you for all of your wisdom.